So I want to welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Nick Marshall and I'm the manager of exhibitions and programs at George Eastman Museum. Uh, this is our second live webinar. We had pretty good success with the first one, so we're crossing our fingers. We don't experience any technical difficulties, but uh, if we do, please bear with us. Uh, today's talk featuring students from the Photographic Preservation and Collections Management Program is part of a monthly series we typically do at the museum called Focus 45. The premise of the program is to give our members and the public insight and access to what is going on behind the scenes at Eastman Museum in a relatively quick 45 minute format. I'm just making sure I'm not muted. <laughs> um, so our May Focus 45, uh, we'll be with George Eastman Museum legacy curator, Kathy Connor, and that will be on May 16th. Uh, and so as spring is really starting to come into full bloom, Kathy will be discussing the history of the gardens at the historic estate. Uh, but before that, we have a very special panel discussion on Saturday, May 2nd at 1 p.m. As, as part of our Bee Nettles exhibition, we'll be hosting a live webinar with B, Renya Matar, and Jessica Todd Harper that will be moderated by Jamie Allen and will focus on the lives, uh, the artists' lives as mothers, educators, and makers. So let's dive into uh, today's presentations. The format will be to have each of the four students present a 10 minute overview of their thesis projects. If you have uh, questions along the way, please feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. We will answer questions after everyone has had a chance to present. Because of the volume of attendees we get, it's easiest and provides the best experience for everyone if we limit the amount of people who are speaking to just presenters and moderators. Co-moderating the panel with me is Heather Shannon, uh, Associate Curator in the Eastman Museum's Department of Photography and Faculty in the PPCM program. Heather will be monitoring the Q&A and will now introduce the speakers. So I'll hand it over to you, Heather. Thank you, Nick. Um, as Nick said, my name is Heather Shannon, and um, I'm a curator in the Department of Photography. But um, for today's um, event, um, more importantly, I had the opportunity to work with each of these students over the course of the year, starting with the master's essay course in the fall. And I'd just like to congratulate each student for fine projects that they developed really um, well over the course of nine months. Um, it, they've been a delight to work with. Um, each student chose an object, group of objects, or even an archive uh, housed at the George Eastman Museum as the focus of their topics. Uh, today, Rebecca Gorovich is going to lead the discussion. She is going to be presenting on the International Fund for Documentary Photography, which was a project of Mother Jones, and it happens that we have the archive of the IFDP at the museum. Becca um, both cataloged and wrote a critical essay about the IFDP for her master's essay. Up next, we have Maya Swan Vitale. Maya was interested in Czech photography and um, it, her interest led her to the collection of Rudolf Skopets, who was an important photo historian and collector in the 20th century of Czech photographs. And the museum acquired um, several hundred works by him. For her master's essay, Maya cataloged um, almost 200 or 200 objects. Uh, it was, it was a, an immense amount of work. And, but today she's going to be presenting on the importance of the collection to the museum and to the field. Um, next we have Zhao Chun. Zhao Chun used the, uh, the Thomas Mott Osborne's album called Japanese, Japan and China to explore the importance of, Ch of Chinese photography in the 1870s. And he has posited this album as sort of a, a touchstone of um, Chinese photography in the 1870s, seeing, arguing that it's a transitional object, that it demonstrates a transitional moment in Chinese photography when pho photography studios in China went from the hands of Westerners into the hands of Chinese photographers. Uh, wrapping everything up, we have Forrest Soper, who has um, ambitiously set out to um, uh, process the archive of Roger Merton, a, a, a very important American photographer. Um, I believe that Forrest is going to be focusing on his biography today and the steps he's taken in processing the, the, um, the very large um, 
archive or personal papers of Roger Merton. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Becca Gorovich. Hi everyone, like Heather said, my name is Rebecca Gorovich and my project is called Encountering the Mother Jones International Fund for Documentary Photography Records. In 2015, the George Eastman Museum acquired the records of the Mother Jones International Fund for Documentary Photography, a project dedicated to funding long-term documentary projects from around the world through an annual competition. The acquisition proposal for, the, for this archive, hereafter known as the Mother Jones IFDP, states the reasons why the collection was a worthy addition to the museum's photography collection. It asserts that the archive represents a pivotal era in the field, given that, quote, it covers the decades between 1990 to 2010, a period during which the digital turn, the rise in social media, and a burgeoning market for art photography resulted in a major rethinking of photography as a whole and of documentary practice in particular. Members of the committee agreed with these justifications and the proposal passed. On August 12, 2013, five pallets arrived at the museum, at the museum carrying boxes of photographs, manuscripts, ephemera, 35 millimeter slides, CDRs, uh, VHS cassettes, DVDs, and much more. In 2015, the George Eastman Museum officially acquired the collection. While the photographs were transferred to the Department of Photography, the slides, promotional materials, and administrative files remained unprocessed in the Richard and Rene Menschel Library. For my master's project, I arranged and described these records created a guide to facilitate access, and wrote a critical analysis of the fund's impact on and placement within a history of documentary photography and technological innovations in the field. My presentation today has two parts. First, I will outline the history of Mother Jones IFGP made possible by analyzing documents in the archive. I will then discuss the archive itself and the process of arranging and describing the collection. When the founders of Mother Jones established the magazine in 1976, they were cognizant of the tendency for news outlets to concentrate on political issues rather than the activities of multinational corporations. In response, they sought to cover pressing topics like environmental degradation and social justice. In 1987, Carrie Tremaine started working as the Mother Jones art director. From the beginning, he wanted to make his mark with documentary photography and acknowledged a lack of photo essays in magazine publications at that time. Determined to utilize his new role in a way that supports photojournalists and long-term projects, Tremaine approached documentary photographers Ken Light and Michelle Vignes to devise a plan. In 1989, the trio, known as the Executive Committee, launched the Mother Jones IFDP and committed to a yearly grant competition for photographers. Though it was not a direct project of the publication, the Mother Jones IFDP found early support at the magazine. The editor permitted Tremaine to spend part of his working hours on this new project and its parent company, the Foundation for National Progress, agreed to act as fiscal sponsor. After establishing the Mother Jones IFGP, Vignes attended a Magnum photo agency party in Paris and approached Sebastião Salgado, a prominent documentary photographer from Brazil, to tell him about the new venture. Salgado was so enthusiastic that an agreement was drafted securing his involvement. Salgado stipulated that he would have, quote, the honorary title of chairman of the Mother Jones Fund Steering Committee and would allow his name to be used in fundraising appeals, end quote. An important aspect of the Mother Jones IFGP's development is specified in this document. Salgado requests that, quote, starting in 1992, the fund will give at least five grants, one each to photographers from the regions of Latin America, Asia, Africa, Europe, and North America, and that at least one of the judges must be from Latin America, Asia, or Africa, end quote. An international committee formed with Salgado, Graciela Iturbide, Mark Rebode, Graham Nash, Mary Ellen Mark, and others as members. 
They were tasked with identifying emerging photographers from the around the world as potential competition applicants. It was also essential that they raise enough money to award multiple grants per year. So the committee solicited photographers to donate fine prints for sale and establish the fine print program. Salgado, for example, committed to donating 30 sets of three prints over 10 years, and many others donated throughout the years. In 1990, with a basic structure in place, the executive committee submitted a report to their fiscal sponsor, quote, the Mother Jones International Fund for Documentary Photography was founded as a response to the near absence of a critical practice in photography, especially in the media, and of an appreciation of the profound ways in which photography shapes modern consciousness. It is among, doc among documentary photographers that we find the commitment to long-term, in-depth studies that fully realize the camera's ability to explore complex social phenomena. All seemed well throughout the 1990s, but the fund's time at Mother Jones came to an abrupt end. In 1998, Mother Jones staff and Foundation for National Progress board members re-examined the publication's finances during a transitional moment in the magazine's history in print publications at large. Until this point, Mother Jones only acted as a conduit for the fund, holding its finances in a bank account controlled by the foundation, which had no input regarding monetary distribution. However, they concluded that the Mother Jones IFDP owed approximately $150,000 in administrative fees. Via the fine print program and other fundraising events over the years, the project had raised thousands of dollars to award photojournalists from around the world and had amassed a solid sum of money. Without the approval of the executive or international committees, the Foundation for National Project appropriated the Mother Jones IFDP bank account. Resignation letters ensued. The executive committee sent one, as did Salgado and other fine print program donors. In 2001, the newest board member at the Foundation for National Progress, Andy Patrick, became privy to the situation regarding the fund, which was largely his impetus for joining. Patrick offered for his new charitable project, the 50 Crows Foundation, to take it over. He went to the Mother Jones office and retrieved anything related to the IFDP meeting notes, financial records, photographs, slides, brochures, catalogs, and ephemera. Although these records were kept at 50 crows, they largely, though not always, did not intermix with documents created by Patrick and other 50 crows staff members in their, in their administration of the fund. In 2002, the competition operated under 50 crows management and functioned this way until 2012, when the fund permanently ceased. The process of arranging the archive calls for gaining intellectual and physical control of the records and to determine a series structure in which the documents are organized and described in a finding aid. Early in this process, out the materials into logical groupings was challenging. Until that point, I understood that Andy Patrick established 50 Crows in order for a nonprofit entity to take over the fund. However, this distinction based on the records was unclear. 50 Crows materials contained documents lacking a discernible connection to the activities of the International Fund for Documentary Photography. For example, many records were associated with a photography gallery space run by the 50 Crows Foundation. I gleaned that the gallery was created by Patrick for photo exhibitions, but none of the documents seemingly had anything to do with exhibitions relating to the grant competition or fine print program. These aspects of the collection caused hesitations and I determined more information was necessary to continue. So I contacted the key players, Carrie Tremaine, Ken Light, and Andy Patrick for phone interviews. These conversations were incredibly insightful and provided essential information to understand the materials. Perhaps the most consequential information came from my conversation with Andy Patrick, who told me that he established 50 Crows just prior to learning of the fund and not after. Furthermore, his foundation did not solely exist to administer the grant's photo competition. In fact, the idea for a gallery space transpired when Patrick connected with a professional photographer named Dan Butnick, who he, whom he invited to exhibit his work on voting and civil rights. This was an event independent from his, his responsibilities he inherited from Mother Jones. The fund was just one element of the 50 Crows Foundation. 
After these conversations, it became clear that the records were actually two collections. The first, called the Mother Jones International Fund for Documentary Photography Records, and the second, called the 50 Crows Foundation Records. I then considered how to physically separate the two collections. In the records are a collection of board of director meeting notes and related documents for the Foundation for National Progress, again, the fiscal sponsor of Mother Jones. A document dated September 28, 2001 is a signed deed of transfer of IFDP ownership from Mother Jones and the Foundation for National Progress to Andy Patrick and 50 Crows. So any documents dated prior became part of the Mother Jones International Fund for Documentary Photography Records and documents dated after this meeting, the 50, Fro the 50 Crows Foundation Records. This important distinction did not become clear until arranging was well underway, and it emphasizes the fun that the fundamental notion of provenance in which records of different origins be kept separate demands attention throughout the entire course of processing in an archival collection. The benefits of these phone conversations prove that incorporating oral history interviews into a methodology is invaluable. I committed then to processing the Mother Jones International Fund for Documentary Photography Records, but soon experienced another yet far more serious interruption. After the COVID-19 outbreak, I no longer had access to the archive. In a matter of days, as our lives were upended around the world and we were faced with new uh, navigating new realities, it became clear that processing the, the processing stage of this project was over for the foreseeable future. Outstanding work entailed completing the arrangement and rehousing the materials and folders and boxes, as well as creating a finding aid in archive space. In conversation with Ken Light, head of library and archives, we determined that it was important to create a finding aid, which makes the archive accessible based on work done thus far. Our decision was pred predicated on several factors. First, a record of work done prior is of great value for any future archivist working on the project. Rather than recreate the wheel, an archivist can access the research I conducted through the historical scope and content and arrangement notes written in the finding aid, as well as my thesis essay. Also, producing a finding aid now acknowledges that the work of archivists is cumulative. As new information is revealed, conversations are had, and processing guidelines evolve, archival records need adjusting. Recording information offers institutional knowledge, making archival records more comprehensive and transparent. This project offers insight to an important story in the history of documentary photography and also in processing an, an archival collection while reckoning with both intellectual and practical challenges. It requires a rethinking of how historical documents are enmeshed with the present day circumstances in which they are brought to bear. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Maya Vitali, and I'll be talking about the Czech photo historian Rudolf Skopetz and his collection of materials at the George Eastman Museum today. During the mid 20th century, Czech photo historian and photography collector Rudolf Skopetz was recognized as a leading international authority in the field. Between 1972 and 1975, the George Eastman Museum acquired from Skopetz 306 19th and 20th century photographic objects, including photographs, prints, albums, portfolios, and cameras. Never surveyed, cataloged, or digitized, the objects from these seven acquisitions represent more than one third of the total of the Czech and Slovak photographs in the Department of Photography and constitutes the foundation of the department's Central and Eastern European holdings. My master's project consists of two parts. First, to facilitate access to these important materials, I cataloged 191 objects associated with the Skopetz acquisitions. Second, I'm writing an essay that explores Skopetz's contribution to the field, as well as the circumstances surrounding the museum's acquisition of the Skopetz collection. 
Today, my presentation focuses on the second part of my master's essay uh, project, the reconstruction and analysis of the collection's acquisition history at the Georgie's Museum not only situates Scopeth's collection in the context of that institution, but it is also a case study that provides critical insight to the historical and contemporary interest in collecting Czech photography in the United States. Photography from Central and Eastern Europe, especially during, by avant-garde artists during the interwar period has garnered continued interest from scholars working inside and outside of the region. Yet, despite this, Scopet's importance, his collection at the George Eastman Museum remains unacknowledged. Scopet's legacy as both a historian and a collector and the contents of his personal collection warrant greater consideration. My project's goal is to remedy this situation by establishing Scopet's and his collection at the George Eastman, George Eastman Museum as a fundamental primary source on the history of photography and the current discourse surrounding photography in the region. As a collector, historian, and practitioner, Skopetz dedicated his life to photography. He authored several monographs and histories in both Czech and German, fundamentally shaping the new field of photo history alongside his international peers, such as Beaumont Newhall in the United States and Ellis, Allison and Helmut Gernsheim in Germany. Widely consulted, Skopetz historical surveys were considered exemplary for their rigorous scholarship and abundant illustrations. As a collector, Scopetz assembled an impressive collection of photographs, technologies, and materials related to the medium's history over his lifetime. Finally, Scopetz himself was a skilled practitioner and active participant in the Czech photographic avant-garde. His knowledge of the history of photography and involvement in Prague's progressive photographic community proved an advantage for Scopetz collecting, especially with respect to 20th century works and practitioners. Unfortunately, it appears that Skopetz did not make provisions for the future of his collection, and it did not remain intact after his death in 1975. It was not until the 1990s that the Museum of Decorative Arts in Prague acquired the remnants of the collection from Skopetz's family. Therefore, the holdings at the George Eastman Museum represent the most comprehensive overview of his original collection held outside of the Czech Republic. Motivations and circumstances behind the George Eastman Museum's interest in Skopet's collection are complex. It is connected to the photographies, to photography's increasing inclusion in cultural institutions at the time, the commercial gallery boom in the 1970s, as well as the political landscape. I began this project with several questions about the collection's acquisition history such as were the acquisitions initiated by the museum or by Scopetz? If by Scopetz, why did he choose an American institution? And subsequently, why the George Eastman Museum? Was there a relationship between the acquisition and the political climate of the Czech Republic? And how did the collection fit within the museum's curatorial and collecting goals at the time? The 70s saw the George Eastman Museum reflect and refocus its institutional mission and collecting objectives. In 1971, the museum's then director, Beaumont Newhall, retired. At the same time, the museum went through a rapid expansion and curatorial appointments in order to build and expand on Newhall's original curatorial direction. William Jenkins and Robert Sobijek were jointly responsible for the Department of Photography's curatorial responsibilities. Jenkins and Sobijek were interested in expanding the Department of Photography's focus beyond American, French, and British photography, specifically in German and Russian 20th century art photography. Prague served as an important international center for cross-cultural exchange in the arts during the mid-20th century. Scholars often attribute the Czech Republic's central geographical placement within the region that was formerly under the Habsburg Empire as the primary factor in the city's cultural status as a draw for avant-garde and amateur practitioners alike. In 1918, Czechoslovakia declared independence from the Habsburg Empire and became an independent nation state. While the country continued to be a leading contributor to movements within the arts, artists were equally interested in defining a national identity and cultural canon that was separate from France, Germany, and Russia. The nation's political tumult was over the almost half century that the country was under communist regime is often cited as the cause behind the limited English language scholarship on the region, and likewise the Czech Republic's 
1989 revolution as a catalyst for renewed cultural interest in the nation. It is clear that the region's history, including that of its photography, received little attention up until recently in comparison to other primarily Western European countries. However, research into the exhibition and collecting practices of museums and commercial galleries in the United States shows this to be a generalization which does not account for the particular interest in Czech photography during the 1970s. In 1971, the George Eastman Museum collect began collecting work from the Czech photographer Josef Sudek, in addition to acquiring work from Skopets. Often referred to as the poet of Prague, Sudek is best known for his contemplative series of still lives and panoramic views of the city. Sudek first received his American, Sudek received his first American museum exhibition at the George Eastman Museum in 1974, and it traveled to multiple venues across the country. Sudek remains an international icon of Czech modernist photography, along with František Dritikol and Jaromir Funka. Photo historian Anna Ferova emphasized their impact by stating, when one looks back at the modernist period, three particular artists who shaped Czech photography stand above all others. Josef Sudek, Jaromir Funka, and František Dritikol not only defined Czech photography, but extended their influence beyond Czech borders. In addition to acquiring work directly from Sudek, the George Eastman Museum also acquired photographs by Sudek, Funka, and Dritikol from Skopets. Just as Skopet's contribution to the history of photography has been underappreciated, the George Eastman Museum's interest in Czech photography has been overlooked. I hope my project demonstrates that the museum's collecting practices and exhibition program played a fundamental role in introducing Czech photography to an American audience. In addition to contextualizing Rudolf Skopet's in his collection at the museum, my master's project will further elucidate the history of collecting Czech photography within American institutions and their practices in the 1970s. To conclude, I'd like to thank the Photographic Preservation and Collection Management faculty, my fellow classmates, the George Eastman Museum staff, and the University of Rochester for their continuous support and encouragement in this project. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Jia Chen Wang now. Good afternoon. My name is. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Xiao Chun Wang. My thesis topic is Thomas Mo Osborne's Japan and China Photograph Album, a case study on photography in China in the 1870s. Thomas Mo Osborne was the. Thomas Mo Osborne was one of the most preeminent members of Osborne family from Auburn, New York. Between 1877 and 1878, Osborne took a world tour with his older cousin, William Morris Davis. During the visit, he purchased a large number of photographs and later organized them into 10 albums. In 1946, Osborne's two sons, Lithgow and Charles, present albums to the same library of Auburn. In 1970, George Eastman Museum acquired the albums as its collection. Compared to his contribution to American social reform, we know less about Osborne's rich experience of traveling during his lifetime. His photograph albums are primary sources to review his world tour in the late 1870s. These albums contain 640 albumin superprints, except for the photographs of Spanish paintings. Most of the photographs are tourist views of Asian and European countries. These albums were bound in uniform materials with Osborne's initials on their spines. The Japan and China album contains 60 albumin superprints, among which there are 17 photographs of China representing the views of Hong Kong and Guangzhou. This essay's first chapter investigates the relationship between these photographs and Osborne's travel in China to identify why Osborne collected the photographs and how he used them. The 
Osborne family papers held in Syracuse University libraries include Osborne's travel journal and the letters from Davis to his mother, which both provides crucial information about Osborne's travel in China. The arrangement of photographs matches Osborne's itinerary. He purchased these photographs not only as souvenir pictures, but for his personal interest in the specific scenery or architecture. For example, the photographs of Hong Kong show the main places he visited. When Osborne brought these photographs home and compiled the album, the pictures form a personal narrative of China that he had visited. Also, because these photographs were produced for visitors, they present tourist attractions through the lens of commercial photographers in China. In a sense, these photographs exhibit the collective memory of Western visitors, who in turn influenced photographers to choose specific subjects through demand. In chapter two, I analyze the transition of photography markets in China, especially in Hong Kong. In the 1850s and 1860s, Hong Kong was the main city that housed the first commercial photography market dominated by Western photographers. As was common at the time, Western photographers kept successfully running their business and established their visual archives of China through preserving stocks of negatives made by former photographers. Starting in the late 1860s, more and more Chinese participated in the new business of photography and uh, through being apprenticed to Chinese uh, Western photographers. In the 1870s, the number of Chinese photography studios increased rapidly. William Floyd's photograph of Queen's Row Central shows how his studio was nestled among Chinese owned photography studios and picture shops. Scholar Regina Thier A believes Chinese photographers, mostly Cantonese in Hong Kong, took advantage of lower prices to gain more market shares. Also, the collaboration between photographers and painters enhanced Chinese studios' ability to juxtapose different mediums to attract more customers. Quote, by the mid-1870s, very few Western photographers remain active in China, end quote. Moreover, at the time, photographers had to update their stocks to capture new scenery and events due to the fast growth of Chinese treaty wars. While Chinese photographers continue adopting subjects established by Western photographers, they came to formulate their own approach to Chinese subjects. For example, Felix Beato's Panorama of Hong Kong Harbor aimed to display the military might of the European powers. However, the view changed a lot in Lai Fang's panorama. Like a hand scroll of Chinese painting, the panorama presents a sweeping view of Victoria Harbor and islands. In 1995, these objects were was displayed in act, exhibition Souvenirs of Asia, Photography in the Far East, and it was attributed to John Thompson. According to scholar Stacy Lambros' survey, the same image appears in several albums produced by Lai Fang. It not, <coughs> it not only demonstrates Lai Fang's ambition to present his skills in photography, but also reflects his conception of photography in the uh, Chinese landscape, which sought a balanced composition of the sky, water, and mountains. Lai Fang took advantage of Victoria Peak's height, and he seemed to offer visitors a detailed map through photography to get them to visit a tourist attraction in Hong Kong. This panorama view might be what Osborne and Davis expected, expected to see when they climbed to the Victoria Peak. Chapter three focuses on Lifon's business strategies and his skills in photography through a visual analysis of his work in the album. According to the existing research and the collections from museums and the private collectors, this as it suggests the attribution of photographs China to Lifon. Lai Fang established his Afan studio near, near the Hong Kong harbor in about 1870. Compared to contemporary Chinese photographers, Lai Fang did better to promote his studio by cultivating foreign residents and visitors. 
and he advised extensively in the local English language newspaper. After 1875, Lai's strongest rivals, John Thompson and William Floyd, ended their business in Hong Kong. Alphonse's new school location, high quality production, and effective advertising enabled it to become one of the best studios in Hong Kong in the late 1870s. Lai Fang expanded his stock by purchasing natives from former Western photographers, including Floyd, so he had a rich collection to imitate the Western style. Meanwhile, he also sought a different approach to photograph China. For example, in the old factory site, John Thompson's lens focused on the Grand Beauty, which was isolated from the poor house in the foreground. Life Fang's panoramic view provides more information about the environment of the native Chinese. In this photograph, the American concession is positioned to the left section. The right section presents numerous boats running and mooring on the Pearl River, reflecting the boom of the foreign trade. Moreover, in the foreground, there are rows of Chinese houses, which are different from the poor house in Thompson's image. We can even see a Chinese resident working on the roof. Therefore, this panoramic photograph recorded the rapid trans transformation of the urban sites along the river, convening a harmonious relation between the concession and the local life. The photographs of China in the Japan and China album provide a significant illustration for us to understand Thomas Osborne's travel in China. It also offers a glimpse of a transitional moment in Chinese photography in the 1870s, during which Chinese photographers were breaking with the conventions practiced by Western photographers. The attribution of these photographs to Lai Fong and his Arfang studio increased the album's archival value. This essay suggests that scholars who are in the field of Lai Fong and the early photography in China shouldn't overlook this album because it not, only, it not only provides physical objects, but also a historical context of the circulation of Lai Fong's work in the 1870s. Thank you. And I'm, I'm just going to step in for a quick second here and, and just mention that if anybody um, has any questions uh, for any of the, uh, the presenters, you can start uh, sending them in through the Q&A button at the bottom. Uh, and then after Forrest's presentation, we will get to questions. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Forrest Sober, and my master's essay project is on processing the manuscript materials within Roger Murden's archive at the George Eastman Museum. Roger Murden was a photographer and educator who was well regarded in the Rochester photographic community, known as both a master black and white darkroom printer, as well as a celebrated color photographer. He exhibited internationally and was awarded fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation. Merton was contemporaneous with artists and scholars such as Nathan Lyons, Betty Hahn, Minor White, John Sarkowski, and Carl Chiarenza. After receiving a grant from the Judith Rothschild Foundation in 2006, the George Eastman Museum acquired Roger Merton's archive. The acquisition contained approximately 50,000 objects, including roughly 23,000 photographs, 11,000 negatives, 10,000 slides, 470 folders of manuscript materials, and numerous ephemera. While Merton is best known today for his typological series of subjects such as Christmas trees, basketball hoops, and Carnegie libraries, the archive covers the entirety of Merton's photographic career. The museum had initially intended to fully process and exhibit these materials by 2009. However, the vast majority of these objects remain unprocessed and uncatalogued and are therefore largely inaccessible. The goal of my master's essay is twofold, to, pr to process the manuscript materials found within the archive and to create an institutional processing plan for the remaining materials in the archive. Before explaining the specifics of my project, I want to give a short history of the materials. Prior to arrival at the museum, the materials had been divided and were in the custody of two separate agents. 
At the time of his death in 2001, Roger Merton stored his archive in two locations. While Merton spent the majority of his professional life in Rochester, he moved to Minnesota in 1992, taking much of the archive with him. The majority of materials were acquired from Elizabeth Earing, Merton's partner, from their house in St. Paul, Minnesota. The remainder of materials were acquired from Merton's sister, Ruth Meyer, from Merton's second home in Rochester, New York. After the acquisition was officially approved by the Photography Committee in 2006, all of the materials were stored together at the George Eastman Museum in a room informally referred to as the Roger Murdom Room. At this point in time, David Wooters, the collection manager for the Department of Photography, created an inventory of the now combined materials. DOP staff members then began to item level catalog a selection of photographic prints further rearranging the materials on their object level as they completed this work. In 2012, for his PPCM master's thesis, Adam Ryan worked on a selection of 850 8x10 negatives, which featured Christmas trees and basketball hoops as their primary subject matter. Ryan removed these negatives from their boxes, housed them in polyester sleeves, assigned each an object number, and put them in new boxes. The object level the object level catalog records were documented in a spreadsheet rather than being entered into the museum's collection management system, the museum system, or TMS, as it was believed this would ease future data entry. The museum initially attempted to process the archive in TMS through the use of box level records. After creating the records in TMS for many of the boxes and objects, the museum soon recognized that the archive could not be fully and properly processed using TMS records. Around 2015, the Department of Photography recognized the archival nature of this collection and ceased item level cataloging in TMS. In 2018, the museum determined that not every object in the archive should be cataloged on the object level. The materials were divided into two distinct groups. The first, the Roger Merton papers contained manuscript materials, negatives, slides, and artist proofs. The second, collection objects, contained Merton's final prints. While a selection of manuscript materials had previously been transferred to the library around 2014, in 2018, the remainder of archival materials, including negatives, ephemera, and artist proofs, were transferred to the Richard and Rane Menchel Library and subsequently to off-site museum storage. This intellectual unification of the manuscript materials with the archival materials created what is now collectively referred to as the Roger Merton Papers. For my project, I am processing the manuscript materials in the Roger Merton Papers. I chose to process these materials for two reasons. Primarily, the manuscript materials will provide important contextual information about Merton's life and work which will aid future researchers and museum staff. Additionally, unlike the photographic materials, the manuscript materials have not had their original order altered and thus further processing can begin. The manuscript materials are composed of 19 boxes containing correspondence, notes, documents, journals, publications, and other ephemera dating from approximately 1960 to 2001. As of April 18th, 2020, I have received pertinent archival materials housed in the museum's offsite storage, completed a survey of all 50,000 objects housed in both the Richard and Ronnie Mental Library and the Department of Photography, received approval for the processing proposal of the manuscript materials found within the Roger Merton papers, and started processing the manuscript materials, and began creating an institutional finding aid for the manuscript materials in the archival management platform, ArchivesSpace, under guidance from the Stephen B. and Janice G. Ashley Associate Curator, Jamie Allen, and the Head of our Library and Archives, Ken Fox. While processing, I've made note of all photographic objects found in the manuscript materials and housed them in polyester sleeves. Any photographic objects that may warrant curatorial consideration have been flagged. Additionally, documents that require conservation review have been flagged. Under supervision from Ken Fox, any volatile objects that pose a risk to other collection materials, such as organic matter, liquids, and consumables, have been documented, photographically reproduced, and properly disposed of following museum protocols. 
I have currently processed approximately 20% of the manuscript materials in accordance with current archival standards and procedures. However, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has prevented me from continuing to physically process the archive. While I do intend to complete processing the manuscript materials, this task may need to be completed outside the scope of my master's essay project. Rather than continuing to process the archive, I'm now focusing my efforts on a finding aid for these materials in archive space. In addition to entering the data for the boxes and folders I have physically processed, I will expand on a biographical timeline created by Adam Ryan and a literature survey created by then PPCM master's student, Jessica McDonald. While my finding aid will be focused on the manuscript materials within the Roger Merton papers, future museum staff can easily expand on the finding aid as the archive is further processed. This finding aid will increase public access to the Roger Merton papers, adding both, aiding both researchers and museum staff. After creating the finding aid for the manuscript materials, I intend to create an institutional processing plan for the remaining photographic materials in the Roger Merton papers. The remaining photographic materials present specific challenges that must be addressed before future work can be done. Before the archive can be fully processed and the photographs fully cataloged, museum staff will need to determine whether each photographic object should be housed in the Department of Photography's collection or in the library's archive. As there are nearly 45,000 photographic objects in the archive, including final prints, artist proofs, working prints, and Polaroid SX-70 instant photographs, this task will require significant effort and collaboration between departments. My processing proposal will highlight the issues particular to these materials, such as the archive being acquired and compiled from two disparate sources, the potential restoration of original order of the negative materials and methods used to potentially determine whether a photograph is a collection object or an archival object. It is my hope that my master's essay project will assist future scholars in understanding Merton's influence in the history of photography, increase access to the manuscript materials found within the Roger Merton papers, and aid future museum staff in processing the remainder of the archival materials. Thank you. At this point in time, I'd like to turn the conversation over to Heather Shannon, who will be moderating questions for the speakers. So um, I'd like to thank Joe Struble for asking um, each participant a, a question. I think I'll start with his question for Maya. Um, he, he, he comments on the visual treat of seeing the works of art that you showed. Um, and uh, he, 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 he asks, why do I associate these images and perhaps their acquisition mostly with the technology curator of the time, Phil Kondax, who may have often visited the che Czechoslovakia and had connections there? Um, since you didn't mention Kondax, um, does Joe, he asks, have this wrong? Hi, Joe, that's a great question. Um, and I'm so glad you brought it up. So Philip Kondax is certainly one person that I'm looking into that may have been the primary contact for Scopets at the museum. And for those of you who are not familiar with Philip Condax, he's the, he was the Department of Technologies curator during the 70s. Um, and Condax's military service, he was based in Czechoslovakia, so that might have been, but I'm also looking at correspondence between Scopets and Newhall, but I'm still, still searching for who was the main point person for bringing the collection over. I hope that answers your question. Oh, Heather, I can't hear you. It's because I muted myself. Yeah, um, well, maybe, pause after that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe Joe will have a follow up for that. But um, uh, in the meantime, um, someone has a question for Zhao Chung. Um, have you, Zhao Chung, found copies of the images in your albums in other albums or collections during your research? And if you have, have these finds helped you to attribute the photos to specific photographers? Yeah, uh, um, 
before I started the, 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 the research on these photographs, I just, um, um, you get um, many collections from the museums, like uh, um, getting a museum and the uh, welcome libraries. They uh, collect uh, many uh, photographs of uh, John Thompson and William Floyd, and uh, uh, through the comparison, a comparison of this collection to the photographs in this album, I I find out uh, 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 some 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 of them can be attributed to Lai Fong, and uh, I want to add uh, important information that's the uh, private collector. Uh, Stephen Levin, Leventhal, uh, he was very uh, important collector who collected over ten thousands of uh, Chinese photographs in the late uh, late nineteenth uh, century. So he also held an exhibition in the um, uh, John Johnson Museum and the uh, Cornell University. Uh, this. Uh, uh, exhibition about Lai Fang's uh, work, and uh, in the exhibition, I found four photographs. Um, they are the same as the, the the photographs in this album. So this information all uh, helped me to attribute the Lai Fang's work. Uh, and uh, yeah, and also I think. Um, uh, there are also uh, some other collections in Chinese museum. I also use them as um, um, visual resources to help me identify Lai Fang's work. Um, actually, another question for you, Zhao Chun. Do you have any information on local Chinese and Malay photographers in Singapore uh, that might have been included in the Osborne albums? Um, yes, um, actually this album, uh, the title is Japan and China, and the first uh, 35 photographs are about uh, the views of Japan, and the next 17 photographs are uh, Chinese scenes, and uh, also the last seven photographs are uh, scenes of Singapore and uh, Panam, but uh, for those photographs, I um, I found some similar images from other uh, museums, but they also um, uh, they they also don't know who the photographers were. were. So um, I for this part, I just can I identify some uh, some um, locations of the. Uh, in, in the images, but I, I, I can identify the photographers. Um, yeah. Right. Um, Becca, um, Joe uh, seemed to remember that the quote unquote crown jewel of the acquisition uh, was Color Transparencies by Nan Goldens in her, by Nan Golden, her Ballad of Sexual Dependencies. Does he have this right, he asks. Yes, uh, Nan Golden's Ballad of Sexual Dependency is included in the acquisition and has been transferred to the Department of Photography. She actually won along with a couple other photographers during the first year of the competition. And this was the year prior of Sebastian Salgado's involvement in which he stipulated, um, essentially made it the International Fund for Documentary Photography in which the emphasis was photographers working in their home regions. Um, so while there were other um, award winners from the United States in years prior, um, the emphasis was really a photographer, photographers from other countries around the world. But because that stipulation was not in place that first year, we do have um, American photographer, non golden um, represented from, I believe it was 1991 is when she won the award and it's in the Department of Photography. Um, so, so Forrest, um, uh, Joe has a comment for you too. Um, and 
for those of you in the audience who don't know, Joe is the former collection manager in the Department of Photography. Um, he says he was there when the boxes and boxes and boxes of the Merton archive passed by his desk. Um, and he said um, when it was acquired, he was trembling with fear. Um, but David Wooters um, assured him that um, every museum ought to have one of these, one of these archival collections and the opportunity to understand an artist's vision in such detail. And I was wondering, um, sort of, it, first of all, that it's more of a comment, um, but um, if you can find a, a question in there, that would be great. Like, what have you learned about Merton in going through all of his, um, all of his photographs and all the manuscript materials? How has it given you insight into his life? And work? Absolutely. Um, so expanding upon the size of this archive just a little bit, when it first came to the museum, I believe it was 92.8 linear feet um, worth of materials. Um, and it contains, for the most part, um, the vast majority of all the work that Merton did in his entire career. This was expanded upon uh, because he was best known for these large typological surveys that he would do, where he would photograph similar subject matter over the course of many, many years. Um, one of his most famous series being the Tannenbaum series, where he would photograph Christmas trees in people's homes um, over the course of decades. And so because of his working method, taking many images of similar subjects, for, for decades and the expansive nature of this collection truly is overwhelming. Um, when I did the survey of all, every uh, box in this archive, which took me a bit over a year, probably a, a year and three months um, working through the summer, I discovered countless boxes of projects that he made and work that he made that really have not been discussed um, in an academic content. Um, you know, large format Polaroid pictures that he did of athletes, um, countless thousands of boxes of small SX-70 Polaroids that he did when he was working for them. Um, so one thing that I've really learned in going through this archive, one that's as expansive as this, is how much it can tell us not only about his work, which hasn't been written about in an academic context, or some of his work, which hasn't been written about in an academic context, but also particularly in the manuscript materials by looking at all of the letters and correspondence that he had with all of the artists and curators and scholars of the time, you're able to glean a much larger insight into the photographic community at that time. That's great. Uh, so, um, Heather, Heather. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, can I, can I hop in and ask a question? Uh, sh uh, sure. Um, just so, and just so the audience knows, in case your question isn't addressed, um, we, we will have a copy of them that the participants, the panel participants will answer, can answer later. Uh, so my question is very quick for Forrest. Um, how, is Merton's work being exhibited frequently? N not, maybe not even just necessarily the work that the museum holds, but just are there exhibitions of Merton's work still going on today? Merton um, passed away in 2001. And during that year and in the years um, following, there was a lot of current exhibitions of his work in memoriam. Um, but outside of the George Eastman Museum, the largest holder of his work um, is the National Gallery of Canada. And I believe they have um, approximately 500 prints of his work. Um, and that's not currently be, being shown to my knowledge. So I don't believe, or at least I'm not aware of any shows um, currently or in the past maybe two, um, two or three years that have shown his work. Okay, thank you. Of course. With um, an exception, there were, um, some facsimile reproductions of snapshot photographs um, that I believe VSW um, included in an exhibition on the history of the organization, the Visual Studies Workshop. Okay. So I think we have time for one more question. And um, so this is for Xiao Chun. Um, 
from Professor Joanne Bernardi. Um, if he, she wonders if you've had a chance to study the Japanese photographs in the Osborne collection and whether you can tell us if it's possible to identify the photographers of those 35 prints. And if so, are they Asian or are they Western? And are there any connections between the Japan, China, and other Asian photographs in the collection, like an overlap of photographer or topical focus? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, um, I should um, remind that the, uh, the development of uh, photography in Japan and photography in China, they were, they were different. Uh, I would say uh, Japan, um, um, at, at that time, uh, the commercial photography in Japan is well developed and uh, many local Japanese photographers uh, uh, start their business. And uh, it seems the, uh, in the 1870s, the, the Japanese photographers have had dominated the, uh, the local market. But for China, this is just a transi transitional stage. And actually, as uh, what we see uh, in the uh, the last photograph I present, that that was uh, Lai Fang's work in uh, in the eighteen eighty five. So it means around the mid of eighteen uh, eighties, uh, Chinese photographers, like in Hong Kong, they dominate the local market. Um, and uh, for uh, these. Uh, so for the photographs of Japan, I also uh, I want to uh, um, uh, actually I have a, a, a additional information that this the second album in Osborne's collection. The first album is the um, the 60, 60 photographs of Japan. Uh, so this album just uh, uh, present the, the 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 last two stops. Um, of Japan, uh, Osborne visit. And uh, as the map I present, you can see Osborne uh, leave the Japan in the, uh, um, uh, December of 18, uh, 1877, and then he traveled to Shanghai in China. So um, if you look, look, uh, look at the, the 10 albums, they are half a, Actually, they have a, a, a sequential uh, order, but the albums themselves don't have the initial uh, uh, numbers to to show the order. I just uh, um, uh, uh, I just fr uh, find the the, uh, the order from the uh, Osborne's uh, travel journal. So um, um, in this sense, I think. If we, we if we um, consider the Osborne's uh, whole collection, uh, I means uh, ten albums, we should uh, have a broader view of the his uh, uh, world world tour. And uh, in this case, I just uh, focus on the photographs of China. So um, and uh, and and I think. Uh, uh, the first question, uh, actually, it's not a question, just uh, additional information about uh, Thomas uh, Osborne. He's a, he was a, a, a notable uh, prison reformer. And uh, we also should notice that they, he, he from a very uh, notable family. And uh, his grandmother is uh, Martha Coffin Wright. And uh, her sister, Lucretia, uh, Coffin Moat was uh, William Davis' grandmother. So these two guys, uh, they are from the very uh, notable families. And uh, uh, so they're, they kind of represent uh, uh, the American upper class uh, who visit um, Asia and the European countries uh, in the 1870s. So uh, that's a a bigger context of the to uh, for the research of his travel. So, uh, for my, I say I I just I just can't 
uh, focused on these uh, 17 photographs. Yeah, and uh, um, maybe in the future, I, I will uh, conduct uh, more research on uh, the relationship between Chinese photo photography and uh, Japanese photography. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Nick. I, yeah, I uh, think I think that that's all we have time for today. Um, I do want to thank uh, all the presenters. Um, it was really fascinating to hear uh, your research. Uh, I want to thank all of the uh, attendees who have uh, participated, and uh, I hope everyone is staying safe and is doing well out there. And we're gonna, uh, our plan is to continue to do more of these web, live webinars, um, uh, at least through uh, probably May. Uh, so uh, keep a look at our calendar and website. Um, we'll be doing them probably about, we're kind of about every other week right now. Um, and like I said, the next one will be on May 2nd. Uh, that will be with B. Nettles, uh, Renya Matar, and Jessica Todd Harper with Jamie Allen. So. Uh, thank you all for joining us, and uh, there will be a recording of this on YouTube in the very near future. Uh, take care, everyone.